Imran bin Talim, who is also from the Department of Architecture at the National, the National University of Singapore. Um, some of his um, research um, include, um, well, his, his research on architecture around Southeast Asia. Yeah, and, and Southeast Asia. And one of his projects I, 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 we will all be talking about is the Singapore, Singapore Stories, which he, well, as I understand, it, it's a project that he, he wants to uh, do, his, uh, it's an ongoing project to reconstruct the, light, the landscape between the Bugis, uh, Kampong Lam, Galang, and Geylang area, and how life was like. It, was, it is not just the, the physical landscape that he's hoping to uh, reconstruct, but also the social landscape. Okay. So today, we have invited him here uh, to talk about another cemetery that's important to us. Uh, and it, interestingly, we have many, we used to have many cemeteries in the city area, places like um, the the Maxwell Road and Tanjung Pagar MRT area. That used to be a, a Hakka a cemetery hill that's been leveled to, to fill the you know, like this, and that's um, a, a, oh, Now many of us know that the entire area from Iron Orchard to Vista Orchard to Nia City to Mandarin Hotel to the International School behind it used to be the huge uh, Teochew Thai Swanting Cemetery and that's the one. There are many places like the current uh, Singapore General Hospital used to be a cemetery here. So, uh, so was the Tiong Bahru estate that's now under conservation. So, but um, on Victoria Street, uh, there's, there's still this uh, historic cemetery. And is, is it called Jalan Kubo? Does it have a name? Because we never really figured out the name. I've been informed that uh, people used to just call it Victoria Street. Mm, it's a bit of okay. And it used to be part of the uh, Istana compound of the uh, Sudan Palace, which is of course now the Malay Heritage Centre. Right? So, yeah, I've, I've, I've visited the place and I was quite surprised to find a very tranquil and uh, serene corner uh, in there. And, and there is also an elevated uh, spot in there for the royalty. Right? So, today, would you tell us about this? Yeah, thank you. It's a weekend update. Uh, so today, as, as uh, Lipsin has kindly introduced, uh, I'll be talking about this very historic cemetery at, uh, well, the road that leads, uh, actually the cemetery is divided into two parts, and the road running through the middle is called Jalan Kubo, which literally means cemetery road. Uh, but of course, the main road passing through it is Victoria Street, so I think in the past, most people just say Victoria Street Cemetery, so you know it. But of course, it's also the uh, Royal Cemetery, but in addition to the royal graves, there are also the graves of merchants of the Kampung Glam port town, as well as ordinary folk who live in uh, Kampung Glam. In that sense, it's a very, very integral part of this very old part of Singapore uh, town. Yeah. So maybe without further ado, I'll just introduce you to the context. So there, it's, it's actually, well, this is Victoria Street. This is uh, Roger Canal, or Roger River, it used to be a river. It's, one of, it's the first river in Singapore to be made into a canal a very major infrastructural undertaking by the colonial government, if you can imagine. It was already canalized, made into a canal, way before Singapore River was embanked. So Singapore River was still marshy and swampy. There are maps to show this, whereas this was the first cut. So that shows this part of Singapore is very, very much developed early in Singapore's history. And of course, the, the court the court used to be about this big, slightly bigger than where Jalan Sultan is, and this is Arab Street here. And what I've traced out here is the conservation district called Kampung Glam. But actually Kampung Glam as a port town is a lot larger than that. It included this side beyond what we call Crawford Estate, right? Beyond Jalan Sultan all the way to Crawford Street. Yeah, with Hajar Fatima Mosque as the only remnant there. Uh, that used to be a, a, a very important part of the commerce of, of Kampung Glam, as well as this side which has now that you know Park View Square, the chocolate tower. There used to be a few streets over there, right? Yeah, it's very important. Well, anyway, the Jalan Kubo is basically part of the royal axis of the core Kampung Glam, royal compound, before it got, uh, you know, shop house uh, proliferation, yeah, because of the selling of the plots. Now, so, this royal axis in front is Sultan Gate. That's the name of the road. If you go through the center of the palace, at the back there is a kink where North Bridge Road is before it continues Jalan Kubo all the way to uh, the river. If you look at all the maps, well, 
Uh, this, this old map shows you that it's, it's not quite an amorphous site at all. There are actually boundaries. It's bounded by walls. It's actually bounded by low walls, which you can still see if you are at this bus stop. If you are ever at this bus stop, you will see the low wall and you will see some of the graves here. Uh, the graves over here, on the other hand, are set back from the main road by a great grass patch. And that's because there used to be shop houses here before you get to Malaba Mosque. So Malaba Mosque, you will notice there's a five-foot way here as well, a shop house. In order to go past the admin building, uh, the Malabar Muslim Jamaat, uh, an association building before you enter. There's an interesting story to why the mosque is there, and we'll come to that. But now let's start with the cemetery and its historic urban context. And we'll talk about three things. Uh, one is uh, the Royal Port Town, which I keep mentioning, but I haven't really elaborated on. And this thing, the Bugis Town. And there is yet one more thing. There's, you can differentiate Kampung Glam from Bugis Town from the Royal Compound. All three are different in the story maps. Second is the term Kampu. You know, of all the three so-called racial districts in Singapore, racialized, actually all three are mixed. If you look hard enough, you'll know they're all mixed. Belilio Zain is, you know, is in Little India, for example, and Jamai Chulia is in Chinatown, and Chongpan School is in Kampung Glam. You know, they're all mixed, but if you, if you look at it in terms of uh, the term, then we, we have uh, uh, the term Kampung for Kampung Glam. And then actually, we're going to look at uh, how it relates to a town setting, and lastly, again, what I mentioned briefly just on the importance of Puerto Rico. So first, this old map, which is often neglected. There is an old map by Captain James Franklin, sorry. Captain James Franklin, where you get Chinese town, Malay town, and Bugis town. This precedes the Jackson Plan of 1822, which is far more uh, well known. So we, we are familiar with Bugis Kampong, Arab Kampong, the Sultan's compound in the middle, European town, and then there's a Chinese Kampong and a Chulia Kampong. But this older town that precedes it shows that there was a Bugis town here, and that's the royal compound. And then a Chinese town and a Malay town, that's so IA over there. So, of course, there's a lot of complication just looking at this, but I won't go into that. It's not the place to do so. With, uh, but why Bugis Kampong? Because the Bugis, in the very early period of Singapore's development, was uh, crucial to Singapore's viability as a port town. You get this uh, interesting 1833 publication, the Trilingual Dictionary, translating from English into Bugis, which is shown in both the Bugis script called Lontara. This is not Arabic, it's Lontara script. You see this script on some of the tombstones in Jalan Kubo. That's very rare. It's very difficult to find that even, for example, in the Malay Peninsula, in Malaysia, Malaya. It's very difficult to find that. Uh, because Singapore was an important 19th century center for trade for the whole, 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 whole of this region. And uh, also Bugis in uh, Roman script, and then finally Malay. So in fact, the, 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 there was reason that it was felt reason there was felt to be reason enough to publish such a book in such a young settlement as Singapore in 1833, and to know how to read it in Bugis. You know? Building materials. Uh, there are many sections containing about 2,000 words, and of course they are important because the Chinese uh, trade was what the, the British forbidden. And before this, they were trading in Riau, which was the free port of the region. Everywhere else, the, uh, the, the Dutch controlled through monopoly. Yeah? Uh, but the, the Bukis operated the port of Riau just south of Singapore, and that's where the Chinese traders came. And some British country traders, and others those private traders were kind of illegally trading. And uh, the, the Chinese traders come to Southeast Asia because they wanted certain goods that the Bukis supplied, contravening the, 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 what the Dutch wanted. The Dutch didn't want anybody else to supply the Chinese these goods and themselves. So the Bukis was so-called pirates, huh? because they, 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 they flouted Dutch monopoly laws. Huh? So actually, the, therefore, the British needed the Bukis to come here, otherwise the Chinese would not come. The Chinese did not need British cotton goods. The, the Chinese also did not need British opium. We all know this one. This one has a long history. The Chinese only wanted Southeast Asian goods by the Bukis traders. So the British needed them to come. That was one reason. Just to, to address the question. Well, let you look at this other town. This is a recent uh, uh, um, map, uh, or map recently rediscovered. And actually, this is an illegal photo I took. You're not supposed to take photographs. This is state property, not for you and me. There's, there is a sign inside the exhibition in National Library. You cannot take photographs. If you want, you can buy. I don't know how much it costs. You cannot buy it. So I took photographs. So by right, I should be arrested. This one is illegal. I cannot take photos. So I took photo, never mind that I show you, even worse. <laughs> so you so all in the with me already. This is illegal. But anyway, um, this is the, a map that again, this is 1820, even earlier than the Franklin map just now, the Franklin map. So this has Bugis Town over here. 
this has Kampung Glam over here, and then the Sultan's house over here with the mosque somewhere there. So what, what we can do is we map it out, is that's the royal axis, that's the center of the compound. This would be Basra Street today, leading up to the mosque, very early. And there's evidence to say that there was such an early street. Uh, in the old maps where the survey had, had already begun, you can see the street. So in other words, you can differentiate. The Kampung Glam is on this side, where Haji Lane, Bali Lane, Chai Marisa Lane, Jeddah Street. That was Kampung Glam all the way to Rocho Road. There's another one that, that shows that it's all the way to Rocho Road. And then, this is called Sultan's, just this Sultan's house, basically, this whole thing is his. And then you have Bugis Town on this side. And that's not surprising because if you go back to the, uh, oh sorry, if you go back to the uh, Jackson plan, you will see the same thing. So this older map also uh, says this side is also Bugis Town. So what is called Kampung Glam on this side is also Bugis Town. And if you go to the Jackson plan, you will see, okay, there's no more Bugis Town, it's over here. There's Bugis Kampong and Arab Kampong. And then this is not called Kampung Glam, this is called Sultan's. In other words, Sultan's compound. I just want to clarify this because the, the cemetery is here. What was the urban context in the past? And you'll find quite a lot of important Bugis burials in this particular cemetery. So this is what happened in the first actual survey of Singapore town. This is a, the result of an 1829 survey. The cemetery is here and here. So basically, I'm uh, sorry, bas basically what you get is that by this time, you get all the road, this road running through, the famous kink, right? Everybody knows this thing about North Bridge Road, having to kink past the mosque and the Sultan's inner compound, as opposed to his outer compound, just to get past, you know? And in Malay, Chondong means slanted. So, you know, by right, it should bash right through the mosque and the Sultan's premises to get there, to the destination. But you have to Chondong, have to slant, okay? To go past the mosque and the Sultan's premises. But the tombs are still there. In other words, by the time you get to the 1829 survey, a lot of things have happened, apparently. But the, the cemetery is still there. And you get these tombs of the Malayan princes. Now, I have to mention here, why princes and on, why not kings? Because the first two sultans of Singapore were not buried in Singapore. They were buried in Malacca. The first one is in Trangkara Mosque. The second one is in Mumbai. Both are in Malacca. You can still visit the tombs today. But uh, thereafter, they are no longer called sultan, they called them Ku. Because, you know, the British decided oh, we don't want to grant any royal status to you. Of course, it doesn't matter what the British say, but in the sense that it matters then they say on their maps, huh? princes, they don't say kings. That's the reason, in case you were wondering. So, now, the term kampong, how come it comes in? I, I said I will mention it. And that is that the, we, we have forgotten that it actually comes in as the word kampong can, came into English to refer to an urban ward. That's why there was Arab Kampong, Julia Kampong, and so on. Arab Kampong, right? Actually, means town. The older map says Bugis town, the new map says Bugis Kampong. Which one do you want to believe? Both are correct. Because Kampong means town, uh, an urban ward, a small town. So you also get from the word Kampong, it's both cluster of buildings and village. You get the English word compound, etymologically. So when we say a compound, we're actually using a Malay derived word, compound. And you will see many compounds, burial compounds in Jalan Kubo, the cemetery. And of course the houses as well, but I won't go into this. But you can see, for example, in this case, this used to be a compound, then it was subdivided around the shop houses and the house is in the middle. Yeah? But it's actually the same typology as Malay Kampung House. It's just two stories with the ground floor uh, closed in. And also morphologically, you see compounds, they are with houses in the middle, right? So the Kampong, compounds, Kampong, and then you get shop house lots. Uh, that's the morphology, as well as names. So what is supposed to Bugis Kampong in this particular 1842 and also in 1846 map, you see the name Kampong Rochor. And then you see Kampong Glam, and then this is the Sultan's compound. That's that's our conservation district today. Actually our conservation district therefore is not Kampong Glam per se. You know. It's actually the Sultan's compound that has been developed into shop houses. The Kampong Glam on this side with the chocolate building and the mosque 125 years old when it was demolished, that was Kampong Glam also. And then on this side also, Kampong Rochor is part of that town. So two towns, Kampong Glam and Kampong Rochor, flank the royal compound with the cemetery up here. And then there was also Kampong Bengkulu. And so on. And so when I, when I refer to uh, Kampong Glam Port Town, I refer to these. That it's all surrounding the royal compound, but there were all the merchants around it, eh, who were buried here, as we shall see later. And then other kampongs which are more uh, urban fringe and then getting rural as you go out of the town. 
So kampung be means both urban war, like that, shop houses and streets, as well as these rather more urban fringe and rural ones, which were involved in trade, but more sea-oriented. So for example, shipbuilding over here. And, um, and just to talk about uh, Rocho River's importance, if you look at this old navigational map, so this is actually a navigational chart. If you zoom in here, you see new cut being emphasized. So for a navigational chart, it was deemed important enough to bother to write new cut for Rocho River, the new cut of Rocho River. Yeah. Singapore River is there, like I said, it's still marshy at that time. So with all this, what emerges is that there is a very important town on this side of, of Singapore, and on that side is the Rocho River side. And in, with some of the boogies who were buried in, uh, in uh, Victoria Street were actually, for example, doing this kind of thing. This Haji Ambot Dalit Daim Pasandre actually built a retaining wall for Rocho Canal. He actually did that. You know? So it's really, really part of Singapore history. And uh, this is the new water cut I was talking about, Rocho Canal. Right? So now we have Rocho Canal Road. Basically, it's referring to this. And the project that you saw just now was there. So Haji Ambo Dalit Daim Pasandre, the Bugis merchant, was doing this retaining wall. He cut it so that it's, uh, it's fa faster to get past. Eh? And actually, there's a reason for this, because he built two timber depots upriver. If you go down, you look at this. This is one of his projects, the same person, different spelling. Daim Pasandre Esquire. So he built one timber depot, a second timber depot. So the Bugis merchants, well, actually nowadays I read, I, was, I remember once, I went to the junction where Rocho Canal Road and uh, Bankulan Street met. There was a National Heritage Board plaque. I didn't take a photo, you know, unfortunately. I should have taken a photo. It actually said the Bugis were pirates. <laughs> it actually said that. So you know, we're very funny people. We forget our own history. You know, something. Today we have this Rocho River celebration. It's silent about the cemetery, and it's silent about everything else, about the history of the river. So it's just supposed to be fun and games, right? So it's this cutesy little thing taking off its construction hat and saying, Rosho River comes alive. But we don't know its history. So that's quite sad. Huh? And, and therefore, I think we can put, for example, this uh, cemetery here as part of that, the story of Rocho Canal, which was a very important part of early uh, Singapore history. Oh, by the way, that, that, that retaining wall will be here, behind ICA building. The one that that Daim Pasandrek person built. Yeah? He was a very wealthy uh, Bugis merchant. So his two timber depots were here, and the retaining the wall he built was up here. Now, uh, just a, again a quick one. Eh? Um, looking at the background before we go to the, the, the preamble is very long, forgive me for that. I hope you, you can humor me for this. Now, another thing that is very important about, about uh, the cemetery is that if you if you know Singapore's early history, then okay, we know about this, huh? the, the Panchor or the Bukit Larangan, which was 14th century Singapore's uh, hub. So the Royal Hill was here, the Royal uh, Tombs were supposed to be here, according to Crawford. Crawford saw terraces and brick remains and so on. He assumed they were the tombs of uh, the kings of ancient Singapore. He felt that way. We don't know for sure because we don't we don't see enough. Huh? By the time we get to uh, archaeological interest, those things are gone. Well, we only have Crawford's 1820 account to go by. But if you look at this older 1604 map, we also know that there was, in the period after 14th century Singapore and before 19th century Singapore, a Shah Bandar or Port Master somewhere here. If we map it out, this is Tanjung Gu, this is Tanjung Paga, and there are two rivers, Singapore River and Rocho River. Somewhere in the middle, there was a Port Master's center. So we you know, there is this question, eh? what, where is it, and we don't know. Uh, well, we have archaeological diggings here and at the Istana Kampung Glam site, but we don't have anything here where the name Kampung Glam is. So the name Kampung Glam may be very, very old, yeah, because there was something here between this river and this river. In other words, it could be a Padang area, it could be Bras Basa, it could be Middle Road, it could be, we don't know. It could be Rocho Road, it could be Ophir Road area, it could be Arab Street area. Or could be, well, well, if you ask John Nixick, then you didn't really find anything at the Kampung Glam site. Istana Kampung Glam, sorry. Istana Kampung Glam site, which is this one, this red square here. But that means we don't know the rest, huh? unless uh, we're talking about immediately around Pada. So now, if you look at it that way, in the long way or the longer duration, then we are, we are talking about an older centre here. And because when the British came, they were smart, you see, they took over the Royal Hill, right? Raffles built his bungalow on top, where the Malay kings used to have their palace. So he's a new ruler. The British also put up a new flag staff. You know if you conquer something, you put a flag, right? 
So what did he do? He put the British flag on top of the Malay Royal Hill. So it becomes new Singapore centre. Yeah? So if that is already taken up, there's a new centre. So that's how you can position. You know today we celebrate the Christian Cemetery at, at uh, Fort Canning Hill, don't we? Well, there's another town centre at Kampung Glam, the secondary one, with its own cemetery. But we don't give a hoot about it. And we, we care more about the colonial cemetery only. So that's kind of a lopsided view of Singapore history in that sense. Huh? Because each, each town centre had its own cemetery. Yeah? The Christian cemetery, which is well celebrated and fortunately for us, well taken care of. Although I know that at least about half of it had to be exhumed, you know, because it got overcrowded and then the land was in the part of So during colonial period, it was already exhumed. The Fort Canning Christian Cemetery already. Yeah? But we still have the Royal, uh, well, the Royal as well as uh, Common Folk Cemetery at Kampung Glam, the other centre of Singapore. So if you put it that way, then, then Kampung Glam Cemetery becomes very important indeed as a cemetery associated with the other centre in Singapore. And of course, if you look at this map, this is looking from Mount Wallach, past Teluk Aie, the bay, towards Kalang Creek or Kalang Bay, past Tanjung Bu, and then you see this area where Kampung Glam is, eh, and Rocho River. So you see this particular Percy Carpenter oil painting from 1856. It's rather interesting because the ships, it shows, probably this is the so-called Bugis season, where the ships are all going into Kalang Bay Harbour, past Tanjung Bu. So this is the spit of land called Tanjung Bu. And then this is Kalang Bay, the entrance to Rocho River will be there, and Kapung Glantang will be there. So the Padang and the Esplanade will be here, right? In Singapore River, Teluk Ai Market and Teluk Ai Bay from Mount Wallach. So this painting in 1856 shows the kind of port activity. But it's a completely neglected part of our history. Coming back, we have this. Huh? We have also have evidence that the roads here are very old. As you know, this is a new cut, but there is this road that has a stump into the swamp after the new cut. In other words, this road was already laid out by the British long before Rocho River was straightened. There is this evidence, the stump of a road here. And the other evidence, maybe this is a bit more debatable, is that the, the river used to cut in here. And if you look at the wall of the cemetery, it seems it's, it cuts in at an awkward angle as well. I don't know what is the reason, but it seems to be parallel. But that is open to question, but I'm just wondering aloud whether that is the, whether that is the reason at this particular angle I'm talking about, where the old river course used to come in a little bit more at this particular angle in the, in the wall. And also, if you look at old maps, you'll find, okay, this is Tombs of Malayan Princess, we looked at that. This particular one, the name of the road, the Royal Axis, changes. So today, it's just called uh, Jalan Kubo, right? Ordinary name, uh, cemetery road. It used to be, there was one map, 1862, that says Sultan Kramat. Kramat is a stronger word, of course, right? Yeah, it means a shrine. Eh? Uh, and Sultan, of course, we know what, the, what Sultan means. So, there is that, there is that older name, which is no longer valid. Today, we just call it the... Here's a more detailed uh, look at the surroundings. Now, actually, this site is very much part of uh, Kampung Glam as a historic town, but it lies outside of, well, these are some of the structures, it lies outside of the conservation district, um, but if you really look at the, the history of it, it's very much interconnected. So these are some lines that I drew. There are many more that can be drawn, and we'll look at some of these connections. Uh, in fact, there should be one more that should be drawn to the building called the Sultan today. You know that, that hotel called the Sultan? It's along Jalan Sultan, right? Actually, that used to be the royal printing press of the Riau royal family who fled in 1911. They fled Riau in 1911 because the Dutch wanted to take over the Riau royal household. So they came over with their printing press and set it up in Singapore. But guess what? The person who built the, sh the building in which the royal printing house is, is uh, housed is actually not the Riau royal family, but um, a, a Singapore merchant. And this merchant was from South Borneo, so he's called Banja, Banja Masin. Eh? So he's Banjaris, and this particular merchant is buried in Jalan Kubo as well. Yeah? So that, that particular enclosure of Banjaris merchants uh, also can be connected this way to what is called Kampung Intan, because they were diamond merchants. So that's one particular area in the southern part of uh, Basra Street, the one that is not pedestrianized, that was formerly called Kampung Intan. And then you have, of course, this is the, royal, the, the, the most important royal mound that's connected, of course, to the palace. Uh, there's one, here is a small mausoleum, you look at that, of a Buddhist merchant, Haji Omar, who is the father of Ambok Sulo, the second justice of the peace after Yunus Abdullah. So his 
family's big house is down here at the corner of Java Road, gone already, and uh, Subawa Road, right here. They own eight houses, that's their headquarters, but they own many more shop houses uh, in the larger area. And uh, you can draw, for example, there's a just, another justice of the peace, uh, Fatima Harun, not to be confused with Raja Fatima, this is another illustrious uh, lady. She's buried here in one corner of her family and uh, cluster, and she lived in this com compound house here where Golden Landmark is today, and so on. So you, you know, at Noisy, so you know, Aljunids are buried in this enclosure. Their, their graves are all gone. Uh, they exhumed it because they feared URA was going to exhume the graves. But they have their you know, school here. This is rebuilt. They used to have a, an older building there. But of course, some of you might already know, the URA Master Plan of 2003 and 2008, I was told this can change, so hopefully you can change it, but 2003-2008 says this is residential, plot ratio 4.9. And it goes back before that, no need, so it's already, it's outside of the uh, conservation district. But 1958, it wasn't yet deemed uh, a slated for redevelopment, it was still cemetery. Yellow with green means cemetery, that's the legend, I checked. So it's not yet slated in the slanted wall plus this, right? But uh, 1985 already it was earmarked at that. Red slash red diagonal lines means earmarked for comprehensive development. So as early as 1985 it was already so good thing 2013 we still see it, but it was already earmarked long ago. And when the Algerians heard of it, they quickly took away their graves. And that's a big, a big, uh, a big shame as we shall see later because their graves are very, very important from a morpho uh, from a typological point of view. We'll come to that. So in summary, the, the kind of demolitions that took place around the grave are very alarming if you look at it. Kotaraja Malay School is gone, this whole thing is gone. The shop houses along Victoria Street is gone. So if you go along Victoria Street, it's all built up, right? When you see the site. You don't see shop houses, there used to be shop houses. There used to be shop houses in front of the cemetery too, next to Malabar Mosque, and other buildings around here. And then all these shop houses over here are all gone. So actually everything around it is gone. If you go across as well, Sungai Road is gone, right? So actually all around it is gone, you know. Cemetery is the only thing left here. If you put it, if you look at it that way, then it's quite scary. Uh, this is what it looks like, right? So the, the diverse, social cultural diversity of the area around it, the demolitions, and then that's the cemetery right in the middle. The areas that are demolished, the areas that are protected, Little India, Kampung Blanc, and then the cemetery right there. So really, really, it's quite a central position. In the past, people used to walk back and forth, side Alvi Road, Jalan Sultan, now you can't do that. I just did that the other day with a group of students. They felt very depressed. This part here is very depressing. All them look demolished, right? This side as well, you can't walk across anymore because of the construction. So Sumai Road used to be... I mean, Sumai Road is just streets with no building. So, this, therefore, if you look at it in that perspective, it emerges, this side here emerges as a very significant uh, pocket that still remains. Eh? If, you, if you go through, you know, many, many uh, images and then you so, one particular connection that I mentioned was uh, this mausoleum here of the Bukis merchant uh, Haji Omar and his son on Sulo. So their house was here. This is the three main units and then another five there and another three here at the corner of Subawa Road and Java Road. So that's the connection. If you go to, uh, well, these are just images of what it looks like today in case you were wondering. This is the area. So their house would be somewhere here today in case you were wondering. So ICA building is here. Um, if you, well, then of course, uh, Java Road, the, the context of uh, the, the street where the house used to be and alternate uh, houses, this is the house. So if you go down, just now, Hajar Fatima wants you go down the street, you'll find the house of Haji Omar on Ambo Sulo right there in, at the corner. So you will notice one thing, they sign using the bookie script. So I look through, the, 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 the only the bookies sign in their own script for, for, for uh, building uh, drawings registered and uh, kept with the municipality in Singapore. Um, another uh, connection is to the other part of town that is demolished, uh, this side. If you go to this side, I just skip through, eh? the, the, I, I mentioned just now Fatima JP, Fatima Harun, who is a justice of the peace. So this is her house. This is where um, Golden Landmark is today. Yeah? So her house used to be here. She was also a uh, chairperson of the Singapore Malay Women's Association. So when they had you know, events, it would be held at her, her house. So this is the classic example of a compound house in the middle of a compound surrounded by shop houses. So we enter through a gateway beneath one of the shop houses. 
So every time you go past, go down and mark, you know, I used to be this one. Yeah? Uh, Fatima, Fatima Haji Harun TV. So, uh, oh yes, and of course, the Bugis Merchant Dying Cassandra, these are design timber depots. We, showed, we, we saw the drawings just now. Of course, all this is connected back to, uh, well, if you go just a bit further, this is, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, Jalan Kubo. So as I mentioned, as I would like to repeat, if you look at it that way, then this is a very significant site. And now we come to the cemetery itself, um, a closer look at the site. Um, well, you've seen this, huh? just a quick review. These are, these are the kind of uh, morphological character of the space. The people who are buried there are of various ethnicities. Of course, they are all Muslim because it's a Muslim cemetery. But it's a very diverse group of people. So you have, of course, the royal house, but most people would think it's the royal cemetery. Yes, there is a royal cemetery, but we also have uh, uh, family enclosures of merchant families. So Banjaris, as I mentioned just now, from South Borneo, the Bugis. Uh, one particular uh, one that I single out, and that is Fatima Harun, because of her, her role in the Arab street community and the Kampung Glam community in general. Um, the Javanese residents of Kampung Glam, this one is still an open project. We need to find out a little bit more. It's very difficult to find out. We know there are many Javanese residents from Kampung it's difficult to identify where they are buried in uh, Jalan Kubo. So that's still something that needs to be looked into. The Aljunit family enclosure is easy enough. It's, it's, uh, we know it where, where it was, although, like I said, it's been exhumed. And then there are hundreds and hundreds of unidentified graves. This is the royal mound. Probably this is the most prominent feature in people's memory. Yeah? But the, like I said, this is not where the first and second sultans of Singapore are buried. Rather, these are their descendants. The descendant. Not even the third, because the third is also buried in the in the mosque, underneath the, the dome facing North Bridge Road. So these are the descendants. So it is still royal, but not of the first three uh, rulers installed in Singapore. There is there is this question of how old the structure is. You can look at the old maps and you know it, it dates until at the very least the early 1900s. But we don't know how much older it is because older maps don't show it. But probably we have clues in its material form, and these granite slabs overlaid on uh, on bricks, which are not modern bricks, but the flat bricks that would have come from the brick kings, but that were found just north of Kampung Glam. We don't know. So there's, there's that opportunity to find this out with Kampung from a material culture perspective. Some of the graves of the uh, royal descendants, I won't elaborate on who they are. I mean, you can find out, for example, if you visit the site, there are these very useful markers of who they are. These are relatively new, they're from 1950, so they are the, uh, probably the latest, the last generation of burials on the site, 1950s. Um, and uh, this is uh, again 1950s. So those are the royal descendants, and then the, if there are yet others. Uh, I, if we look inside this royal mound, there are these grave markers that are of a different material. Yeah? And well, I'm not so sure, they look like they are actually yeah, I'm not so sure what material this is. Huh? Um, it, could, it could be that they are older than the rest because of the difference in material. But that has to be kind of, uh, that has to be checked. Again, it has to be verified. So there are only one, two, three pairs. The gravestones come in pairs. Huh? There's a headstone, there's a footstone. So they will face Mecca, and Mecca is that direction. They must lie on their right. In other words, this must be the headstone, this must be the footstone. They are lying with the head there, turned to the, on their right facing Mecca. So that's how you look at it. So you don't walk between the two stones, not between the headstone and the stone. And, and as I mentioned, there's also the, this is beneath the big dome of Masjid Sultan. Now within this, you can see the variety of tombstone shapes. If you know the tradition of tombstone uh, profiles in Southeast Asia, and, uh, you will know that these are simplified versions. The original versions are very elaborately carved, but by the time you get to the 19th century, it kind of gets abstracted. It's, uh, it, sometimes bear these uh, carved profiles, but otherwise it is kept uh, very much more uh, simplified. Another enclosure that may be connected to the royal family is this one, this enigmatic small structure with steps going up, just like just now. Probably this is royal because nobody who is not royal would dare to build such a structure with steps going up, you know. The other thing that strengthens my supposition is that the cloth on them are yellow. Supposedly this means that they are of royal descent. And and this this gives a lie to the to the often uh, you know, often heard uh, suggestion that nobody tends to these graves anymore. I was there. This is a two thousand seven photo I took 
When I came back in 2012, there are cloth, there is cloth there. So people do tend to it. It's not completely abandoned. This is it, a 2007 photo when there was no cloth. So these are the tombstones found inside. Again, there's a variety. There's writing here and there's writing here. There's inscriptions, which is very difficult to study unless you go in. This is a very small space. I think you can't see the scale of it, but if I went in, it's very cramped. I can barely stand. So I, that's why I didn't really uh, dare to go in and take the inscriptions. I take uh, inscriptions of uh, photos of the inscriptions in, in later slides. But this is basically one other question mark. And probably, you know, it's easy to find out once this becomes uh, a more well-known kind of undertaking. Um, of course, there's the Malaba Mosque in one corner of the cemetery, and this has to do with a, a royal grant to, to set up a Muslim, uh, Tamil, Tamil Muslim burial ground in the, at the turn of the century. Initially, this was a project for the, as, as written uh, in the project, uh, Mohammedan King's Burial Ground Mosque, a proposed mosque. So the form would have been a Southeast Asian tiered roof with these uh, finial on, finial, roof finial as well as uh, rich end ornaments with a Julia parapet, the kind that you would see, for example, in Alabra Mosque at Tolo IS3, Nagodarga, and Jamai Julia's Gateway, if you know Jamai Julia and South Bridge Road. So it, it's a hybrid. But today you get this building, which is actually Malabari. So it's another group of uh, South Indians from the other side of Southern India. So instead of the Tamils, you get the Malabaris who are from Kerala, the other side, so Malabari. Uh, the blue tiles were added in 1991, so quite late. Uh, so that's, that's the unique story of this mosque. It's by Royal Grant on a Royal Cemetery land. Um, and of course, the Marikan family know about the, the Marikan family as uh, one particularly illustrious uh, Tamil Muslim family uh, in the region, if not, and not, not just in Singapore. Now behind the mosque is this family cluster. It's a row of, uh, of uh, two stones. And these are the Banja merchants, the diamond merchants I mentioned earlier, who built, for example, the Royal Press Building, yeah, uh, and who operated the diamond uh, trade in uh, the southern end of Basra Street. So this, these are the, 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 some of the bigger graves in that row. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what you will notice is that the construction is of granite, but the, 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 the way they are put together, yeah, the architectonics of it, uh, is in imitation of what you would do if you use wood. Yeah. So this is an older tradition of using wood, which is translated to stone. So they, they, there is this uh, lap, kind of a lap joint uh, at the corners, and you will see this. There are other examples where you will see um, uh, broke, broken examples which, which uh, show the internal structure. And of course, there are all these wealth of inscriptions uh, on all the, the, the tombs. So here, for example, if you look at this particular one, it's a small example, a different kind of tombstone, again, with inscriptions that await, await documentation. Another one that has been recently painted, this is a 2012 photo. In 2007, it was not yet painted. It's been given a coat of silver paint, but you can still make out the, the inscription. Here, you can see this thing is called, now, this thing I was talking about is called the dapur in Malay. Actually, if, now, this is interesting because the word dapur in Malay means kitchen. So nobody quite understands why this is called kitchen. But in Javanese, it makes sense. Because in Javanese, dapur means the form or the, the, the kind of the structure of something. So it's actually a Javanese term which Malays use. It, the, 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 the confusion lies in the fact that the same word dapur is used in Malay in kitchen. Yeah, but dapur is used also, for example, in the Javanese kris. The, the particular number of waves, the particular details on the serrations, all that is called dapur. So this is a, the dapur of the, of the, it's a Javanese word. So here you can see all the principles of woodworking yeah, being applied into different materials. Uh, this, I don't know who removed this tombstone and for what, but what I hear is a lot of uh, uh, people come to the, the graveyard to chip off a bit of the stone. So there's also this esoteric element of, of people wanting to take uh, stones uh, you know, because of their perceived power. And here is a, 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 a this partly dismantled uh, dapur with a toppled uh, hit. I can't remember what it is, headstone or tombstone. And next, door to, next to it is one where the top, the finial of it has been chipped off. So you get this happening 
quite rapidly and we need to do something to protect uh, the graves from such kind of uh, pillaging. But you can see some of the motifs on, on these uh, tapo. Uh, other examples here, again, chip. Chip. It would have been like this with a, with a kind of flaming finial. Here it's chip. Uh, this particular example, the dapur has been completely dismantled like that. Uh, with the inscription on the other side still in that. Uh, this is the, the same one, the one, the dismantled dapur. Here is the inscription yeah, on this side. This side and it's still being tended to fresh uh, cloth. Another one with a magnificent tall dapur. Yeah. And uh, some of the details of the carvings. And here's a tall one, this uh, is Riza, a friend of mine. So we, we went, a group of us went together to look at it. Just to give a sense of scale of, this is one of the taller ones. Slightly smaller than the Banjar one we saw earlier, but this is quite a big one. And it's on the left side of Jalan Kubor, if you enter from the Kampung Glam side. So it's got two levels to the here. Now, I have to say at this juncture that these are all very interesting examples if you know the examples from Southeast Asia. They are very unique in the sense that they are abstractions. They are very much in keeping the 19th century spirit of abstracting and simplifying things. Now, Art Deco is basically simplified ornament. So in this case, these are simplified versions of otherwise highly ornate and carved uh, Southeast Asian tombstone types around the region. So they are very interesting in that sense. You know, if you made a comparison. And of course, the, the way in which they are constructed and. Uh, and, and tear it together. So they're supposed to, so this rests on this. You know? So this is the basic dapur on top of which you have a different dapur and then a final kind of a platform, a, a, a molded uh, body before you get to the headstone and footstone. So that's, beneath it is actually empty. So the, 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 now there is another thing that I should just mention briefly. Actually, the reason for such restraint in graves is that in, in Islamic burial culture, uh, uh, being overly ostentatious is frowned upon. So there's a rather kind of a restrained uh, uh, architectonics to the grave. You're not supposed to make it overly ostentatious. In fact, some people will say you're not even supposed to have anything on top. You should just have headstone and footstone. Now, whereas there are others who say, no, it's fine. It's a cultural thing. So if you have it, so maybe that's the reason the load is transferred to the sides. The dapur could have been invented, for example, in this part of the world in order for the thing not to burden the person beneath. There is this taboo about burdening the person beneath with the weight of their own, you know, cenotaph. You know, that's quite taboo, you know. You, you, you know, it's like a, a sin. If you believe it, it's a sin. Then all the words that you are actually putting the load onto the person very So I don't know whether this is my own speculation. Maybe that's why, you know, it transferred away like that to the dapur around it. So it's not exactly around the person. That you see some remnants of the wooden antecedents of the dapur. So for example, if you're walking in just past the, the bus stop along Victoria Street, you will see this at the corner of the wall. So here you get the wooden dapur, uh, here a wooden headstone and foot, uh, footstone and headstone with the dapur. I don't know what you can see, but here's the corner of the dapur. Another corner. Yeah, one corner, this particular one, another corner. It's all in wood. This one doesn't even have the wood posts. This one does. And you will notice that there are many trees growing out of the grave. And that has to do with the fact that um, many burials would include uh, a planting of trees uh, on top of uh, the... And that's supposed to be sheltering the disease. So trees are fine, but not, not uh, elaborate cemental structures. Sometimes you get... Uh, uh, yeah, here is a, a close-up of the uh, corner posts and dapur, with, in this case, one, two, three burials put together, the same family. Um, other kinds of structures are not so uh, traditional. So for example, this, any guesses what ethnicity this particular burial might be? I mean, judging from the architecture. India? Yeah, you, the first guess would be India, right? These are Bugis, these are Bugis graves. They are all, they are Bugis. So by you know by, by um, so I, I I'm not sure you know when this particular structure was built was it the same time as the grave or maybe much later we do not know uh, but these are Bugis graves so you, you for example for example has this one has three graves one in the uh, four actually sorry one here in the center underneath the center this building mausoleum building shelter 
a small one here, a large one here, and another large one there. And if you look at this particular one, you find uh, Arabic inscription. But if you look at this one, you find not only Arabic, but also Bugis. So here's the first one I'm showing, I think, right now. This is, the, uh, this is Bugis. So this is Arabic, the formula, uh, the Islamic formula. And then it's written in Bugis. And then it ends in Arabic. Yeah, whereas this is all in Arabic. I think you can tell by now how Arabic looks like and how Bugis looks like. Um, and another Bugis mausoleum, uh, this particular one is right next to uh, Malabar Mosque. This was when I visited in 2007. Today we visit it, it looks like that. People have built structures and it's been kramatized, made into a kramat. Now, yeah, well, inside are uh, Haji Omar, the merchant, and his wife. And outside is their son, Ambosulo. Ambosulo is the famous, the more famous one. Everybody knows Ambosulo, not his father. Uh, his father is a merchant. Ambosulo is the one who became Justice of Peace and also the member of the Legislative Council after Yunus Abdullah. So he's the second one. Um, so this was the grade in 2007 and today. Someone added all these accoutrements and the structure. Not in keeping with what I like to see, but you know, who am I to say anything? But this is, uh, this is what, ha what has happened. Then. But I'm glad I took this photo back in uh, 2005, so uh, we know what it looks like. I also took photos of the tombstone and its uh, Bugis uh, script. Inside, the, fa the parents and the father and the mother, uh, same thing uh, with Bugis and Arabic script. This is at the back. Uh, a relation, I can't be sure whether it's really the sister, elder sister of Ambuksulo, I can't quite recall. There was a bit of a misgiving when we were trying to sort this out, a, a few friends of mine and I. But it, again, if you look at this, this has been dismantled, it's all made of marble, uh, but it has been, I don't know what happened, but it's, it, it looks like that today, with the tombstones lying on its sides. But if you look at it again, Arabic and Bugis. If you think about it, this is very highly significant. You can't find these kind of gravestones anywhere else in the region. So Singapore is really special in that sense. And this particular, uh, because Singapore, like, you know, just now Chicken was saying how this like, Singapore is a center for the overseas Chinese and Nanyang. But likewise, Singapore, Singapore, let's put it this way, Singapore was a British port. It was a center for everyone, basically. Not just overseas Chinese. It was also that, so I think to make the story complete, we should look at Dan Kubo. Because Jalan Kubo is like the locus point for all these merchants from the region. And they really, really make Singapore their base more. Because they were fighting against the Dutch, right, basically. For the Bugis especially. So Singapore was their home. And it was where they made their fortune. And where they buried the dead. And where they invested in property. Basically, they invested in a lot of property. Um, this, anybody, anybody familiar with this? Very important and it's gone. That's the biggest thing. Ultimate. This is the, the pioneer, and this particular gravestone format is from Hadramaun, the, the land of origin of the Hadramis in Singapore. The only one of its kind, as far as I know, because the al did did not, do not have a, a, a gravestone like this. As far as I know, none of the al -Kaf. But the al they used to have this inside this particular pavilion. The, the building's walls are still there. This mausoleum building is still there in Jalan Kubo. But the gravestones are all gone because, like I said, they were very afraid when they heard, hey, you are here, you assume. They're going to turn this into residential. They have to get our graves out. So they took it out. It's no longer there. If, you know, and, and uh, this is from Hamza Muzaini. Hamza Muzaini, this is Hamza. He visited it in the 90s. So this is the inside of the second. There are two. There are two. Uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, shelters. So this is this, this, the one that we saw that, that uh, gravestone earlier with this particular uh, lattice on the wall. So this Hamza Muzani is is uh, courtesy of him. I asked him for this photo a long time ago, a long, long time ago, it was 2005 that he supplied me with this photo. Because now, so we still haven't gotten at least based overseas. So we still haven't gotten around to pursuing this further. It's been that many years. This is what it looks like today, 20, oh well, not today, last year, 2012. Uh, this, you remember this lattice motif from, this is from outside. It's like that. If you go inside, like he said, this is inside. Can you believe it? This is inside, like that. And then, you know, with one, I heard this is gone really. A friend of mine told me, hey, this is no longer there. I don't know how come. But I don't know why it was there. There's one inside, and now even this is gone. And so, it's in urgent need of some kind of attention. This is just outside the enclosure. There's one more, it's still a grave. And it's 
shrouded in yellow cloth, so it might be of a royal person. Okay, I should be ending in about seven minutes, so we are making good time. I started, I started 15 minutes past the hour. Um, so this this is uh, the enclosure of Fatima Harun. So Fatima Harun is a very the JP. Remember the the president of the or the chairperson of the Singapore Malay Women's Association who lived up the street along Arab Street, the compound house in the middle. Now. Um, her particular corner of her family enclosure has a yellow wall, and that's because there's a very interesting. Well, this is her corner, right? This is her grave, and then this is the family enclosure. It's a bit longer than that. This wall broke because these two trees became so huge, they broke everything around it. You will see this. So, this is her family enclosure. Her corner has a yellow uh, wall. Well, this is the wall for the family. It fell, so then they made a new wall. Because uh, she married thrice. So her third husband is from the royal family of Singapore. So, so that's that's the yellow, but the rest of the family is not. Um, so there's a mix. Huh? So there's yellow and white. So you can see the color the symbolism behind it. She married a royal, but she is not. She's still commoner. Uh, so there's this interesting mix. Um, and other kinds of uh, enclosures still to be properly kind of uh, understood as to which family who are who are the buried and so on. These are all inscribed. It's very difficult to read, but they are inscribed. So there's a lot of work there. This particular enclosure is a commoner's enclosure. I, I could, uh, uh, when I took this in 2007, I wouldn't know that when I come back in 2012, there will be white cloth there. So again, people are taking care of this. People are taking care of it. So that's how I know it's a, most likely a commoner's. You can see two stages in the enclosure. This is the old wall. And then this is a new wall inside. I think built just in case the whole thing collapses, but it hasn't collapsed until now. So between 2007 and 2012, and now actually, even today, it's, uh, the wall has not collapsed. It's still this wall inside. Um, now, if you look at that same grave stone, this one, if you know Arabic calligraphy, you will find this very, very interesting. So unfortunately, unlike she can, I can't talk to you about the calligraphy in detail because this needs to be studied further. So for example, there's this butterfly motif. We call it butterfly motif. Uh. It's very rare, even on manuscripts. Somebody like Annabel T. Gallup would be able to talk about this, for example. She studies Malay letters. Eh? So something like that, this particular motif here is very interesting. So th there needs to be a, a proper study of, of the inscriptions that you find. And other kinds of inscriptions and motifs need to be properly documented. Um, you know, I'm just going to run through now some examples. Uh, like I said, uh, I won't be elaborating on the calligraphy aspects. Uh, what needs to be done first is to record these, because there's so many of them, so many of them. Now, besides the fact that you have uh, uh, a wealth of inscriptional evidence waiting to be documented, you also have sometimes you find that right stone makes you wonder how old this one is. Because in Malacca, they use laterite stone. As far as I know, there, were no, there was no use of laterite in Singapore. I don't know how this got here. But this is laterite, which is used in Malacca. Malacca's royal tombs before the Portuguese attack of 1511 were, were partly in laterite. Some of the, uh, the mosques of Malacca was of stone in laterite. So they used that laterite for Afa Musa, for example. So we get this pair of uh, laterite tombs. There's nothing left to but the very fact that the tombstones are there is really quite intriguing. You know, this is right tombstone. Um, then there are those of various kinds of uh, materials, granite with a marble kind of uh, overlay with an inscri inscription on it, a panel, an inscription panel. Uh, and then this is rare. This is in wood. This is a pad. And this one is so difficult for me to take it because it's actually very small. This is a root of a plant. Yeah. So I had to kind of like dip and then take it from here, and that's what you see. This is this one. So this one you can't read anymore because it's completely ancho gone. Yeah, but you can still read the inscription. This was from 2007. Uh, I think today is a bit more difficult to read. Like another one. Yeah, a pair of blue stones. Um, that's the overall look. I was there with another friend of mine uh, back in 2007. Another one where the, the growth of the tree is dramatic. I don't know whether you know you, you can maybe judge 
the, the you can tell the age of the of the grave then, right, by the size of the tree. I mean, this tree is so humongous today. It's basically swallowed up the the, the grave. Um, ah, yes, I forgot to mention one of the graves we saw earlier. Just yesterday, the tree toppled. So the, the, yeah, so just yesterday, also tree toppled. Via Facebook, but at least you get find out all sorts of things via Facebook. Um, uh, tomb, tombstone var variation as well. Uh, all these variations, like I said, these are simplified versions, simplified profile versions of more elaborate forms. So, for example, this profile would have curls, curly motifs in the center. That mean, I think you can imagine uh, in their wooden form as well as in uh, marble form. For example, from North Sumatra in Aceh. Uh, yeah, and, and in this, this example as well, these would have lotus motifs. So a lot of it derived from the older Hindu Buddhist culture of the region. Yeah? So this is, for example, it would have been in the lotus bud, but the lotus bud assumed a more abstract notion of purity. So it wasn't deemed to be purely Hindu or Buddhist anymore within the uh, visual language of the region, so it was taken to be just a symbol of purity. Um, here is a particularly, uh, well, kind of well-defined uh, molding uh, version of, of, of the Batu Aceh. There's a particular tradition called Batu Aceh. This is a good example. In this one, it's quite simplified, but the, 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 the inscriptions are in a style that is very, very uh, rare, because you don't usually get embossed. This is embossed, you know? So it's kind of rare. And the script style Parts back to the earliest Southeast Asian version of Arabic script. You get this from the 14th and 15th century in the Straits of Malacca region. When the, when, when the first inscriptions for Malay language using the Arabic script here. So there was its own style, not the Arabic style, not the Persian style, not the Mughal style of India, but the Southeast Asian style. And this is in that style. So it's kind of highly, and that is embossed. It's very, very, very interesting, very intriguing. But it's toppling over, I think you can tell. It's, not, it's resting on something. So I had to again duck underneath and then take a photo like that. Okay, this is from below, very awkward angle, very acute angle here. Uh, further example, this is very difficult to read already. Uh, this is a very strange form. Uh, it's not very it's not very typical. Um, this particular one is uh, here again. Uh, this is like the Batu Aceh, the classic Batu Aceh type. Uh, dating from the 14th, 15th century, but much simplified. But it, uh, there are other, this is hybrid. Just now Chikin was talking about hybrid Kyochu and Hokkien. This is hybrid Batu Aceh and Javanese. Because the Javanese would use uh, triangular motifs like that at the base, but the Achinese would not. The Achinese would use this profile on top. So it's kind of peculiar, it's a mix of the two. And this one shows how important it is to, to quickly document everything. Because sometimes it's quite difficult you know, when it runs out of, uh, when, when, when you can't read something anymore. In this case, it's with a glass panel. You think it lasts forever. This is 2007. It's a mix of Arabic and Bugis. So good thing is, because of this photo, we have been able to read it. A friend of mine who can read Bugis has already read it. So we know who is buried there. But today, if we come back, it's like that. So actually, when I came back last year, I was very frustrated and a bit embarrassed because I told my friends, hey, hey, I want to show you, you know, there's one with Boogie Street. You know? I went around and I couldn't find it and I forgot that it had the glass panel. But I took this photo, these two. Really, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, but I took these two. By accident. I mean, kind of like just taking, because I usually try to take the whole thing and then the inscription. And then it was a few weeks later that I realized it's this one. I looked back at the older photo. So what do we do with this? We break open the glass, something like that. We have to do something, right? we have to kind of like maybe peel off the glass to clean it. Because otherwise you can't read it, it's become like that. It's this one. But based on the photographs, we, 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 we could read it already. And these are some others with, with Bukhi script that I mentioned. Others with different, you know, this is again that rare, very, that rare uh, embossed technique. And this is an uh, incised technique. Some of the variations. These are the no more normal incised techniques here. So the marble, we saw that earlier. And all sorts of others that are you know, uh, uh, variations of paneling. In some, some cases, overlapping circles, a single circle, and so on. And then yet there, there are yet others of completely, if you ask, if you look at the tomb tomb profiles of around the region, there's no such profile. Never seen before. No such profile exists. This 
these are the same, right? Slightly, slight variation. If you look carefully, there's a slight variation. But this profile does not exist in the region. Neither does this one. This is an abstracted East Javanese style. If you go to Sunan Ampel and uh, all the old the 14th and 15th century pilgrimage sites in Java, Muslim pilgrimage sites, you see a version of this, but not like that. It's got the curly motif. This one is completely triangularized. You know? yeah. So we have some of these uh, mysteries, another mystery. Well, to conclude, I guess, you know, there's another way to look at the site, which is also uh, not just as a cult historical cultural resource, but also as a historic pocket park, because the, the lush greenery and some of the trees there are really quite amazing. One of the most amazing, and this I went with the uh, Nature Society. The, some of the per persons I went with are here today. So, uh, you know, this this was with them, and Faiza, we got Faiza there. Uh, uh, this is a very large banyan tree, and uh, probably, you know, they, they were saying this is probably the largest, or one of the largest in Singapore. Probably because it, you know, it was able to grow for so many years, right, undisturbed in, 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 in a part of the city. So it's really quite amazing, quite large. I guess, you know, this is a photo of uh, two friends who we were going with. The next step would be, you know, to, 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 to start documenting. I mean, when, when there are a lot of people I know who are doing something, they are doing it individually, like me also. Like, you know, individually go there and like crazy person take photo of two stones, get bitten by mosquitoes. And you know, it's quite an interesting discovery. I like this photo that I happen to snap because it shows, you know, like a, the great discovery. Like, right, you suddenly find this inscribed, you know, this one is inscribed quite clearly, you know, in a circular panel. But we don't know what we haven't found out yet. It's crazy if you think about it. And I, 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 I started off framing this as part of the Singapore story, right? Singapore history, right? Singapore story is something. Like Singapore history. Yeah, so uh, I think if you look at it that way, then there is a really urgent need uh, to do something about it. Perhaps with the experience and the kind of uh, gravitas that, that has already accumulated with the Bukit Brown uh, effort, we can finally start also on Jalan Kuko. You know, I think that should be a good starting point now with having this talk at all. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.